Homo sapiens. Never in the Earth's 4.6 billion year history has a social species ever inhabited this planet quite like we have. And what makes us even more unique is that of the many Homo species, Homo sapiens are the only ones that still exist. However, just 50,000 to 20,000 years ago, we had relatives who walked this Earth alongside us. Of these relatives, Denisovan and Homo floresiensis didn't leave much fossil evidence, in contrast with the Neanderthals, who left behind many stories to uncover. Who were they? And how did they survive? And why did they leave before we had the chance to live together in harmony? Were we really so different that as a species we couldn't coexist? Today we're digging up the truth about those lost humans. 1856 Neander Valley, Germany An ancient human is discovered, first of its kind. This was the beginning of our paleoanthropological relationship with the Neanderthals. And when Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, research into humanity's origins began in full swing. However, because evolutionary theory wasn't well understood at the time, paleoanthropologists and biologists regarded the Neanderthals as our failed ancestors who couldn't keep up with evolution. In other words, they believed Homo sapiens to be the best version of humanity, with all ancient human species being inferior. A notable example of this took place in 1864, when biologist Ernst Haeckel examined a Neanderthal fossil and dubbed it Homo stupidus. This notion of Neanderthal negativity continued into the early 20th century. Another Neanderthal fossil was discovered within a cave near La Chapelle aux Saints, France, back in 1908. The fossil was found stooped, kind of like a monkey. Nowadays, we can look at this fossil and infer that this person must have had a long and difficult life. But paleoanthropologists imagine Neanderthals looked like this stooped backs, lots of hair, and dark skin, with a bulging mouth and sloped shoulders. This unflattering representation may have risen from the idea that certain human races, natives, ancient humans, etc., are inferior to others. Nations like England were colonizing at the time, which may have heightened this sense of superiority. In her book, Close Encounters with Humankind, Sang He Lee, a professor of paleoanthropology, points out that the restoration reveals how natives were perceived by colonizers at the time. And maybe it was because of this that the word Neanderthal was often used derogatively at the time. However, with the discovery of 350 Neanderthal fossils in 70 European and West Asian locations and the development of fossil analysis technology, our representation of the Neanderthals changed to this, then this, and in 2010, we figured out the pigmentation of their skin. This discovery was published in a research paper in Nature back in 2007. According to the paper, the Neanderthal's MC1R melanocortin receptor gene had a mutation. This gene is responsible for producing melanin, so certain mutations could have prevented melanin from being produced, leaving the skin fairly light in color. It can even make someone blonde or red-headed. On top of that, as researchers discovered that early hominids, Habilis, Gontingenis, had almost no fur even 1.6 million years ago, paleoartists were then able to depict the Neanderthals more accurately. Now, though we shared many similarities with the Neanderthals, there were a few differences. Large noses, short arms, and shorter shins. They also had low, backward-sloping foreheads and prominent cheekbones. If they used the subway, they might have stood out in the crowd. So how then did the Neanderthals live their lives? They were actually quite similar to our own. They crafted spears out of sharpened stones and sometimes scavenged meat left behind by other predators. And what's amazing is that they could use language to communicate with one another. We know this because in 2007, researchers at one of the Max Planck Society's laboratories in Germany found that the Neanderthals had FOXP2, the same gene that enables us to use language. In 2013, it was discovered that our hyoid bone, which supports the muscles that allow us to speak, matched the Neanderthal's hyoid bone. 
To top it all off, the Neanderthals also used fire and consumed grains. Why don't we take a look at this photograph? These are starch particles found in a Neanderthal's fossil dig site, blackened by fire on the left and marked with bites or scratches on the right. The Smithsonian Museum research team proposed that Neanderthals had known how to use fire and had enjoyed an omnivorous diet. In addition, analysis of Neanderthal fecal biomatter in 2014 revealed large quantities of stigmastinol, a biological compound commonly found in plants. With this information, we can guess that the Neanderthals were omnivorous like us, and that they weathered many times when food was scarce. However, after leaving one final fossil behind at the end of the Iberian Peninsula 24,000 years ago, the Neanderthals vanished from the fossil record. Why did these people go extinct if they could form groups and even utilize language? Some paleoanthropologists suggest that competition with Homo sapiens was what did it. To elaborate, the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens competed with one another 80,000 to 30,000 years ago in Western Asia, with Homo sapiens coming out on top and the Neanderthals facing extinction. This 2009 photograph shows a Neanderthal jawbone that was discovered in Leroy, a cave in France. Do you see these sharp markings on the fossil? Professor Rossi of the French National Center for Scientific Research thought the following. Huh? When Homo sapiens used stone tools to cut the tongues out of reindeer, they left markings that look awfully similar. Wouldn't that mean that Homo sapiens killed these Neanderthals? Basically, this meant that there had been violent conflict between the two species, and the survivors eventually evolved into modern-day humans. Even if things weren't so extreme, the Neanderthals' technology was less advanced than the Homo sapiens. The Neanderthals created almost no throwing or shooting weapons, so the Neanderthals may not have been able to survive an ice age with its frigid temperatures because their technology was not advanced enough. In a similar vein, Neanderthal groups tended to have fewer grandmothers to care for their young, unlike Homo sapiens. Professor Sang-Hee Lee conducted research on the subject in 2004. By analyzing Neanderthal skulls by age, she concluded that grandmothers comprised only 39% of the population, including youths, much less than Homo sapiens, where there were more than twice the number of grandmothers compared to youth. With fewer grandmothers in a group, it becomes much more difficult to preserve the group's culture, as well as care for the group's young. This can drastically reduce a group's survivability. There was also a study conducted in 2009, which showed that Neanderthals consumed 100 to 350 kilocalories per day more than Homo sapiens. Well, whatever the reason, one thing is apparent. As the Earth grew colder and colder, the Neanderthals began to dwindle until there were none left. Homo sapiens, however, managed to adapt and survive, which is why we're still here. And this is how Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were divided, as if with a knife. Neanderthals as the species that went extinct, and Homo sapiens as the survivors. It was easy to make that assumption because, even in 2009, we couldn't find any commonalities between our two genomes. However, in 2010, the following year, a groundbreaking study was published that changed everything. The researcher behind it, Professor Savante Pabo, by comparing DNA extracted from a 38,000-year-old Neanderthal fossil with modern human DNA, he found that 1-4% to of our DNA actually comes from the Neanderthals. Based on this evidence, Professor Pabo hypothesized that around 80,000 to 50,000 years ago, humans met and had children with the Neanderthals as they crossed from Africa into Western Asia and Europe. That small percentage helps our immune system, UV protection, and sperm motion, and also provides us with the fat storage gene SLC16A11. This gene is still a part of our genetic makeup and is part of what causes obesity and diabetes. It's this newfound relationship that has some paleontologists proposing that we should stop classifying the Neanderthals as Homo neanderthalensis and instead classify them as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Some even go as far as to say, instead of going extinct from the cold, the Neanderthals simply integrated into Homo sapien groups. But there's a philosophical matter perhaps more pressing than this even. Can Neanderthals and Homo sapiens even be classified as different species? Biologically speaking, 
two different species cannot mate and have offspring, and even if they could, the offspring wouldn't be able to have offspring of their own. Are Neanderthals really just lost humans? What would first contact between the two species have been like? If we did interact peacefully, what language did we use to communicate? Science can help us answer these questions and more, but sometimes those answers open windows to new questions, helping us broaden our perspectives. Thank you for watching.